discussion. So first I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Joe Kennedy, who represents Massachusetts fourth congressional district. Uh, one of the first things I did after joining Congress was to join the Transgender Equality Task Force, which Congressman, Congressman Kennedy chairs. He's been a longtime advocate for transgender equality and an inspiration to me and many others in Congress to not just be pro-equality, but to put equality at the top of our minds and agenda. Um, early on, I remember attending a series of roundtable conversations that he organized with children who were transgender and their parents to talk about the barriers they were experiencing to equal education. And it was really moving and, and motivational. So thank you for being here, Congressman Kennedy. And perhaps you can share some thoughts on the work of the task force and what you see as the major fights we have coming up. Um, Congresswoman, thank you. Um, thank you for, um, first off, just thank you for your friendship. Thank you for pu pulling this together. Thank you for, in the midst of all of the other um, challenges and fights and issues and just concerns that so many of us are, are in the midst of at the moment um, for taking a moment to make sure that we recognize the, uh, the, the moment that we are in, the impact that, um, that an LGBTQ uh, plus community is feeling right now um, and um, uh, impact of history and the, the opportunities and I think responsibilities that we all uh, have and share uh, in order to, um, to make this country live up to its values, which I think is what this fight has been about for, for many of us. Um, and I want to recognize and acknowledge that from literally your very first moments uh, as a member of Congress, you have done that. Um, from seeking out membership in the, uh, in the task force to our numerous conversations on the House floor to just the way that in which you've legislated and the issues that you've highlighted and and not many people have done that. So uh, huge kudos to you and got to say, I'm obviously honored to be uh, joining um, uh, two other panelists here that are extraordinary in their own right. Um, and so honor for me to be here with, uh, with Kendall and Jennifer. And so thank you both. Um, I'll be real quick on this because I, I want to hear from them and, and kick this open to a discussion. But I think, you know, the the one of the many uh, I think tragedies of the course of the past uh, nearly four years has been the onslaught that an LGBTQ plus community has felt literally from the first moments where I think as we all can remember, um, one of the first groups targeted by this administration or LGBTQ elementary and high school students, right? Like for whatever reason, after we had a new president come into office, that was where he wanted to focus the beginning aspect of discrimination on, on trans kids in high school. Um, and that was literally just the start. Uh, the relentlessness of the attacks on the LGBTQ Q plus community have continued, whether it's been from the armed forces, as you as you referenced, with a uh, trans service ban, whether it's been on our healthcare sector um, in myriad ways, and I'll get to that in a second, um, in provision of services, and, and whether it's been through adoption, whether it's been from um, aspects of civil rights and, and civil rights applications, civil rights law, um, all the way through, literally, um, almost in every aspect. Um, and so we've had to be busy and the trans equality task force has had to be busy. Um, I calling these various acts of discrimination out, elevating the voices that they've impacted. You, you also were, um, I think, right to reference the enormous um, uh, disparities and challenges that our society has now left on uh, trans women of color in particular, where that life expectancy today is 35 years of age for black trans women of color, 35 in the United States. And as much as my comments a moment ago targeted some of the acts of the acts and omissions by a Trump administration, we can't just say that that statistic is the result of a Trump administration. This is a result of um, decades, if not centuries of uh, codified discrimination in so many aspects of our system that we have allowed to fester that obviously Trump administration isn't addressing but existed long before he was sworn in and will obviously persist long after, uh, unless we do something about it. Last thing I'll say, um, you alluded to the fights ahead and I think we'll get to this in the conversation. I think one of the most pernicious aspects of these past couple of years when it comes to the Trump administration's um, targeting the LGBTQ plus community is that it's been done in the name of protection of civil rights, particularly protection of religious freedom. And 
the evolution of that doctrine from much of the, the LGBTQ plus discrimination we're seeing in healthcare is coming out of a civil rights division in the Department of Health and Human Services, right? Um, where much of what we're hearing or what we're seeing come, from, whether it's been trans uh, members of the uh, trans community serving in our military to um, aspects of just basic civil rights law is being done under the guidance of um, either one, discrimination of differences that don't exist, or two, the idea that religion and exercise of religion allows me to discriminate against somebody else. The, the reinterpretation of, of the freedom of religion to rather being a shield defending myself and my own exercise of it, to being a sword to actually infringe on your own civil rights. And that is something I think that this administration, these judges that the um, uh, Trump administration has, has selected to serve, and on the Supreme Court is going to be uh, have a, a enormous impact for decades to come. So we've got a lot of work to do on uh, on recalibrating that balance. And with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to you and, and kick it to the rest of our panelists here. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. yeah, court situation is really increasingly troubling, obviously. Um, next, I'd like to introduce a leader in Philadelphia's LGBTQ community, Kendall Stevens. Kendall's been working for years at building the strength and resiliency of the community, facilitating Transway, a support group for trans and gender nonconforming people at William Way, one of our great institutions, where she also serves on the board of directors. Kendall is herself a survivor of violence. And Kendall, if you're comfortable, I was hoping you could share some of your personal story. Um, and more generally, what are some of the causes of the epidemic of violence against transgender women of color? And if you also wouldn't mind maybe touching on some of your recent experiences um, with our legislature. Um, yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is uh, Kendall Stevens. Um, I am a Temple junior. I'm studying uh, social work and public health and minoring in communications and activism. <laughs> And I have a deep passion for um, my, my community, the whole entire LGBTQ community, but especially the trans community, because we are under siege. Um, I, I, I tell people all the time, the most extraordinary thing about the trans community is how ordinary we are. Um, but people are tuning into a personal identifier and are using that to target us we're having our identities weaponized against us. And people are forgetting that our basic commonality is our humanity. And that was forgotten um, in, in August, August 24th, 2000, uh, 2020, when a bunch of hateful transphobes barged into my home and beat me senseless. And I, I was lucky to get away with my life. And unfortunately, I, I buried two of my trans sisters who were not fortunate enough to survive attacks on their lives. Um, it was harrowing for me. It was, I was completely um, in fear. I had two children inside of my home who thought they were witnessing my murder, who are now traumatized. See, and this, this, is, this is the problem that this is not happening in, in, in a bubble. And I, I have to look at my godchildren every day. And, you know, they look at me and they, they, they start crying. And they're like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see you again when you leave out the house. We're, we're, we're worried about you. We don't want you to die. And, you know, <laughs> these kids are asking me, why does Trump hate you? You know, why do people hate you? I'm just like, I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. But I will say this, um, I, I will say that I have been attacked before. Many of my uh, trans sisters, brothers and others have before as well. This is uh, routine. This is part of our existence. We take this on. There are a lot of um, people who have come up missing in our community who just end up dead, end up missing. You never see them again, or if you do, um, they find them, they're skeletons and bones. Uh, you find them, they've, They've been stuffed in, 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 some, in some barrel or in some abandoned house, treated worse than trash. And there are a few designs at play that are, are feeding this epidemic. One being the pervasive transphobia that 
has reinforced harmful and untrue narratives about the trans community, uh, especially trans women of color who happen to be disproportionately affected by transphobic violence. Hatred evolves and so does fear and hatred and fear, they are the, the nuts and bolts of the transphobic machine to such an extent that in the black and brown community uh, communities, transphobia has transmuted into a dangerous phenomenon known as trans massage noir. I'll say it one more time, trans massage noir, which is hatred of, contempt for, uh, and I would say also the prejudice against black and brown trans women. There are significant elements at play that we should be aware of that contribute to trans massage noir. Uh, first, understanding uh, that this contempt, this hatred is what it is, um, is deeply rooted in our society, but I would say that it's thorny stems are planted deeper in the black and brown communities where institutional racism and evolved systemic disenfranchisement have taken these communities hostage, literally choking the hope out of these people and fueling their collective despair. Now, with this subtext in mind, we all know her people hurt people, but trauma takes on an energy. It, it takes on an energy form and it, it feeds off of itself within the people that it afflicts. So it's, un, it's not surprising that black and brown communities stratified socioeconomically at or under the poverty line, living with hopelessness and rage are redirecting that toxic energy to people just a bit more marginalized than them, which mm -hmm. happens to be trans people. But let's be clear, the epidemic of violence afflicting the trans community is not just happening in a vacuum that only pertains to the black and brown communities. We are seeing transphobia and trans massage noir play out in every demographic imaginable. Because as we know, unchecked hate runs amok. The last element is governmental inaction in response to the rise of transgender violence in America. What occurs within the sphere of societal, the societal macro level um, has significant influence on our lives um, in the meso level, at the, macro, at the micro level. So when there are no protections from vulnerable communities like the trans and LGB uh, community, uh, that sends a very clear message to, uh, to people. Um, the, and, and the message is loud and clear that uh, trans lives are not valued, they're not appreciated, they're not respected or recognized. And that kind of careless inaction is tantamount to putting loaded guns in the hands of hate. So between the confluence of the social forces I mentioned um, just, just now and, and the lack of LGBTQ protections in federal and state uh, statutes, it becomes painfully clear how this epidemic has taken such a grisly grip on this nation. And I'm, I'm gonna end with this. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I want desperately to believe in that notion, not be disabused of it, because partisanship is being put before people. Because if that's the case, we would have truly lost all sense of our humanity. And I still want to believe in humanity. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, when you were speaking, you mentioned um, having had to bury two sisters and, and you're referring to two um, transgender women of color from, from the Philadelphia area. I'm, a, I'm assuming um, Mia Green and Dominique Remy Fells. Right. Okay. I just- yes, um, Yeah, they, uh, uh, unfortunately, Dominique uh, Remy Fells, she was found uh, in the Schuylkill River with her legs cut off above her knee, both knees. Mm -hmm. She was stabbed, she was beaten. So you can imagine that um, her last moments on this earth were very horrifying. Uh, Mia Green was shot, shot dead in cold blood in broad daylight uh, by um, a, a, a young man who then tried to lie about it and cover it up. Um, this, this, this is not, uh, acts of passion, this is not acts of love. These are acts of hateful, hate-fueled violence, violence. You know, when those people came into my home and beat me up 
and called me a trainee, called me a man, said that I deserved it, said I had a coming. They didn't care that I had kids in there. They didn't care about my life. They didn't, they didn't care about anything but hurting me, hurting me. And I felt like they wanted to kill me. And when you beat on someone, when you attack someone, when you target someone with hateful intent, with violent intent, and you're saying to them that I'm doing this because you are transgender, I am doing this because you are whatever identifier that they're hurling at you. When, when your identity has been weaponized against you in such a heinous way, that is a hate crime. That's exactly what it is. But see, unfortunately in Pennsylvania, even though the woman who led the attack on me is behind bars, she will not be brought up on hate crime charges because there is no hate crime statute that protects someone like me, right. which leads me to believe that I don't matter. Well, we are so grateful to your voice, for your voice and so grateful that you are with us and, and you are recovering. Although, you know, obviously the scars are, are not just physical. Um, you know, I'm, when you talk about your godchildren, obviously it just is heart wrenching to, to hear about that. But, but we are so grateful for your strong voice and, and for your being here. And you're saying you're a junior in the social work school. I'm going, no, no, it's gotta be junior PhD or something here because you speak so eloquently about the very issues that we're talking about. Um, let's bring in um, Jennifer as well. Jennifer Pike Bailey is a senior public policy advocate at the Human Rights Campaign, which is the largest LB LGBTQ advocacy organization in the US. Um, can you walk us through the Equality Act, Jennifer, and explain what the legislation does and how it moves to address some of the cha challenges that we've heard discussed, particularly for a state like Pennsylvania, which does not have those kind of um, universal protections yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for, for having me. Um, I you know, just wanna say that thank you, Congresswoman Scanlon and Congressman Kennedy. You both have been such incredible champions in Congress for the LGBTQ community. Um, and your constituents are very lucky to have you and we are lucky to have you um, standing up for us. Uh, but I really wanna thank Kendall for being here and sharing her story. You know, it's, it's so hard to relive that trauma um, and trans women should not have to relive that trauma in order to convince people that black trans lives matter. Um, and yet, you know, this is still a situation that we're in. And so I'm just so appreciative to you, Kendall, for being willing to put yourself through that um, and, and share that with all of us, because I do think that, you know, the, the best way to um, and stigma is to, to share our stories, even when it's so hard. So thank you. Um, so the, the Equality Act uh, is a piece of legislation in Congress uh, that we've all been working on for a long time now. Um, it would update our nation's kind of foundational civil rights laws, laws like the Civil Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act to explicitly include LGBTQ people. And it does this by including sexual orientation and gender identity as uh, protected characteristics alongside the existing ones like race and religion and sex. So it would prohibit discrimination in employment, housing, education, credit, public accommodations, federally funded programs and jury service. So Congresswoman Scanlon mentioned uh, the Supreme Court decision in Bostick this past summer, uh, which was such a huge win, um, you know, and said that discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity are forms of sex discrimination. Uh, but we still definitely need the Equality Act. That is not enough to protect us. Um, the decision was technically limited to employment. Um, and, you know, we strongly believe that the same legal reasoning uh, will hold true for all laws about sex discrimination, but we can't rely on the courts uh, to do that alone. Um, there are also some areas of law where sex discrimination is still allowed, um, including in federally funded programs and in public accommodations. Um, so the Equality Act actually adds sex as a protected characteristic uh, to those areas as well. Uh, the Equality Act also does a couple of other things to civil rights law. Um, 
when I'm talking about public accommodations, that means you know anywhere that you as a member of the general public uh, can expect to be allowed or, or to be served there. So this is you know restaurants and movie theaters and gyms and places like that. Um, but that part of the Civil Rights uh, Act was written in the 60s, um, and it includes the public places that uh, where discrimination was most visible to the lawmakers at the time. So it literally lists places like lunch counters and soda fountains and mm -hmm. pretty dire need of an update. Uh, so the Equality Act updates that section of the law to include areas where we see discrimination now, um, including retail, uh, transportation services, banking, um, healthcare. Um, and so that change would improve the law for all protected characteristics, not just LGBTQ people, which I think is so important, um, especially as we talk about kind of the intersectional discrimination that so many in our community face. The Equality Act also prevents people from using the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as a loophole from civil rights law. Congressman Kennedy was talking about uh, his bill a little bit with the, the Do No Harm Act um, and this, this notion that people should be allowed to exempt themselves from law as long as they say it's about their religion. Uh, you know, the Equality Act uh, addresses that as well. Um, so you asked about how the Equality Act would help with the problems that we've heard about here. Um, and, you know, sadly, it's not a magic solution you know we're not going to wake up the morning after it's signed into a law into a world where there's no more discrimination and violence um, you know just because we have laws uh, outline discrimination based on race doesn't mean that we don't still have racism in this country um, but what it does do is give people legal remedies when they do experience discrimination and i think that's incredibly important so in immediate you know companies and service providers won't want to be vulnerable to lawsuits. And so they're going to implement non-discrimination policies. Um, schools won't be allowed to discriminate against trans students. Uh, landlords won't be able to refuse to rent to a same-sex couple. Um, you know, we still have a long way to go to change hearts and minds uh, to end discrimination and, and violence, um, you know, as Kendall was talking about. But, you know, I think laws can really help change the culture too. Um, you know, if someone knows that he has employment protections, you know, maybe he'll finally feel comfortable transitioning at work. And now all of a sudden his coworkers realize that, you know, there's someone that they know and care about who's trans and that starts to change their perspective and that lessens stigma. You know, if schools aren't allowed to discriminate against queer kids, you know, maybe now that sex ed teacher that wasn't sure if she was allowed to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity in class, you know, will feel empowered to educate our students in a more inclusive way or when, um, you know, a non-binary person is no longer stopped from accessing appropriate services at a domestic violence shelter, you know, this might keep them from falling into a cycle of homelessness. So, you know, there's no one solution to ending the epidemic of violence against trans people um, because there are so many factors that lead into it, uh, you know, but making sure that trans people have access to jobs and safe housing, you know, slowing down the school to prison pipeline, um, you know, and especially reducing stigma. These are all factors that will help. Thank you, that's that's really helpful. Yeah, just um, reinforcing through the legal process that um, at, as Kendall said, reinforcing people's humanity and, and then allowing those conversations to, to take place. Um, Kendall, we referenced um, quickly um, just recently, you testified in front of the Pennsylvania Senate Majority Policy Committee, which is the first time a transgender woman of color has testified in front of that all Republican body. And I understand you were helping make the case for bringing hate crime protection to Pennsylvania statutes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your testimony and give us a sense of how the hearing went and where we stand with hate crime laws in Pennsylvania? Yes. So um, at that time, uh, I was very nervous uh, because this was um, an historic moment. Um, never before had we seen um, a trans advocate, especially one of color, um, being in a position where uh, she was able to have her voice uh, elevated and, and, and heightened in, in such um, an important way. Um, so I, I knew um, the weight that, 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 that was on my shoulders. But once I got there, and you know, and I, I met uh, Senator 
um, Argyle. I met Senator Killian. You know, they're 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 really nice people, um, and um, and I appreciated um, them allowing me to have that platform. Um, and I, I spoke my truth. I spoke my truth. I, I told them about how um, I never had a fair shake, never, never from from um, an abusive mother. Um, going into foster homes and group homes, um, you know, being being uh, sexually abused, being um, uh, targeted for uh, physical abuse, you know, um, that 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 trauma is heavy. Um, being um, 18 years old with full ride scholarships to colleges, and then my mother deciding to not uh, fill out the FAFSA forms for me, which which was actually um, caused me to be homeless. It caused me to be homeless. It caused me to. Um, um, suffer um, in, in ways you wouldn't imagine I had to live out of integrity um, and, um, and, and live out of a personal sense of dignity. Um, I, I'm constantly hyper aware and, um, and, and that's, that's just not normal. You know, that, that, that is not, it's not fair that every day I have to um, look over my shoulder. I have to constantly look around to, 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 to see if someone's going to attack me or someone's going looking at me uh, a certain kind of way that may put me in danger uh, potentially you know so this this is what I have to live with this is what I take on but I still brave the day I still brave the day I, I I'm still a straight A student I, I wanted I wanted them to know it's not all woe is me know this know that I'm not broken I'm not broken I have, I have broken bones you know, when they came into my home and beat me, they broke my nose. Um, I have two teeth now that are necrotic because they hit me so hard in my face that it broke blood vessels in my mouth, cut my gums, bruised my ribs. This isn't the first time. I have pins in my hip. Okay, two titanium pins in my right hip. Okay, I, I've just the 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 kind of um, the pain that I have I've I've had to go through, and and one life. Um, is insurmountable. But I wanted them to know that still I thrive. Still I thrive. That I know what's happening here. I know that this, uh, these designs that, that, are, that, are, that are happening um, in, in, in the legislation where you're seeing um, you know, anti-LGBTQ um, statutes and, and a lack of H uh, LGBTQ uh, protections. What, but that signals to me is cultural erasure. That's what's happening. But we can't be erased, um, and we're we're taking hold of our voice. We're taking hold of our visibility. We don't have power inherently. We don't have privilege inherently. Whatever power or privilege we get, it's been loaned to us. But we have to give it back. You know, I have this platform here. I'm glad to have this platform. But I have to go back to my neighborhood, where it is transphobic, it is homophobic, um, where people threaten me, um, where people harass me, um, where I am fear for my life 24 seven, where I have so many security cameras um, at, at my home that you would think is Fort Knox, um, where I, I can barely get a wink of sleep, where the nightmares are so severe, I need medication to stop me from dreaming. I don't even dream anymore. So I'm not even safe when I'm sleeping. And I wanted them to understand that this is not about Republican versus Democrat. This is not about black versus white. This is not about um, us versus them. That's the greatest fallacy of all time. It's about humanity, it's about us. And I let them know that this bill can still be signed. Equality bills, hate crime statutes, they can still be signed and you still have permission. I give you license to still not understand or like me, and that is okay. Because one thing has nothing to do with the other. This is about human beings protecting other human beings and stopping the bloodshed, stopping the pain, stopping the trauma. I'm not doing anything to hurt anyone. I wanna be a productive citizen of this country. That's, that's what I wanna do. That's why I'm going to school to better myself. Despite my circumstances, I still thrive. And that's what that's the message I wanted them to know that even though we're getting tormented and targeted, and even though I'm making funeral arrangements as we speak, just in case something happens to me, that I'm talking to my older um, um, family members, 
that are in their 50s and 60s, telling them how I want to be buried. How I had I had to make a, make a living will at 29. That is daunting. I shouldn't have to go through that. When all I'm trying to do is just live my life, live my life as an honest manifestation of my authenticity, my truth, no one else's. And for anyone to infringe on that, um, that is tyranny of the majority is what that is. And I am a minority and, and, I, and, and I, I deserve a fair shake at life. For once in my life, for once in the trans community, the LGBTQ community, we all deserve just a fair shake to just live our lives, that's all. Because we are mothers, we're fathers, we're parents, we're neighbors. We're part of this whole societal network, you know, of people, being around people, being productive, and just trying to live. Um, and um, we, we shouldn't be taken away from this earth by hateful transphobes and homophobes, uh, because the impression is that nothing will happen if they do. See, these statutes are preventative measures. Just hopefully making someone think twice or a third time about attacking us, about murdering us. But if they know they can get away with it, then they will. Well, in addition to your eloquence, thank you for your resilience. I mean, we, we know we've had a lot of writing. Um, the Inquirer had a uh, an extended series a couple of years ago about the impact of homelessness and, and the number of LGBTQ um, kids who were homeless in our region. Um, you know, you've been through so much, but um, your ability to express your humanity and, and bring that truth to people is, is so valuable. So thank you. Um, Jennifer, I, I was going to ask you, you talked a little bit about the Equality Act um, and the path forward with it, but what about the judicial path to LGBTQ equality? Um, of course, it was the court that brought nationwide marriage equality, um, but are these wins set in stone? Because this week, you know, we're, we're facing the extremely rushed confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. And uh, should those of us who care about LGBTQ equality be concerned? Yeah, I, I think we should be we should be very concerned. I'm very concerned um, about the, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Um, you know, Judge Barrett has talked a lot about how she shares the same judicial philosophy as the late Justice Scalia. And that is a very scary thought for our community. Um, you know, the, you brought up marriage equality. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't have to completely overturn uh, Obergefell to chip away at marriage equality. Um, you know, the court is hearing oral, oral arguments in a case the day after election day um, about foster care that, um, you know, asks the question of whether the government has to allow federally funded adoption of foster care services to discriminate against same-sex couples. Um, so it's, it's kind of about all of the rights and benefits that come along with that marriage license. You know, I'm worried about homeless shelters not allowing same-sex couples to access family housing in the same ways. Um, you know, I'm worried about states not allowing same-sex couples to be jointly listed on birth certificates. So there are all sorts of these little things that can happen. Um, you know, it, during the oral arguments in the Windsor case, which was about federal recognition of marriage equality, Justice Ginsburg referred to this as skim milk marriage. And I thought that was a quite eloquent way to, to phrase it. Um, you know, and this has gotten a lot of attention because of the statement made by Justices Thomas and Alito. Um, but marriage is definitely not the only thing that I'm worried about at the courts. Um, you know, we had a great ruling in, in Bostock last summer saying that LGBTQ people have employment protections, uh, but that ruling didn't get into specifics. You know, there could be more cases that come up where the court allows for all sorts of exemptions from non-discrimination protections, uh, especially for trans people. You know, in, in 2016, uh, Judge Barrett gave a speech where she said that the idea that Title IX, which outlaws uh, sex discrimination in education, um, the idea that that includes trans students was, quote, a strain on the text. Um, and she misgendered trans women in the speech, she calling them, uh, I think she called them physiological males. So it, it was just very uh, jarring to see that kind of attitude from someone who's going to be elevated 
or who might be elevated to our highest court. You know, and of course, there are a lot of things at risk at the Supreme Court that would deeply impact LGBTQ folks that I think a lot of people don't really think of as LGBTQ issues, um, like getting rid of the Affordable Care Act, you know, voting rights, reproductive rights. These are all things that, that deeply impact our community. Thank you. Um, Congressman Kennedy, I imagine, like me, you are somewhat concerned about Judge Barrett's um, seemingly imminent confirmation. Is there anything top of mind uh, for you as this uh, confirmation is fast-tracked through the Senate? So I think, um, Mary Gay, two, two things to, to highlight here. And one, <clears throat> building off Kendall's incredible um, statements earlier, um, I think many of us would be surprised to know, I know I was surprised to find out that federal law in many states still codified this discrimination, right? That protection, that hate is actually protected. There is, as you're well aware, gay panic defense that is still codified in federal law, which, which actually justifies a hate crime. It says that if you commit an act of violence upon discovering that uh, the victim is uh, trans, then you are protected from that act of violence, or you are protected from the legal repercussions. That literally, the perpetrator of it can use that law as an affirmative defense to prosecution say, I didn't know, and so therefore you can't prosecute me. Um, that justifies a hate crime. That's not a defense, that, that's a justification for an act of hate. That is on the laws in our federal government, it's on the laws in dozens of states across the country. That law still in 2020. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do and, and Kendall did an incredible job of articulating enormity of not just the, the remaining work, but what that lived consequence of a government that fails to recognize that humanity and that dignity and what that means. Um, and so I just wanted to take a minute and, and, and recognize that. And, and obviously, Congresswoman, from your question about the confirmation of, of Judge Barrett and <clears throat> building off a little bit of what, what Jennifer had to say, uh, look, I think we have, um, we have seen in recent years, particularly, conservative ideology really coalesce around this notion of religious freedom and around the, the misappropriation or, or misinterpretation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act from the law that was, was passed in response to two Native Americans using peyote as part of a religious exercise and losing their unemployment insurance because of it, um, unemployment assistance because of it. And from saying, hey, the federal government's gonna protect religion and say, if you're gonna use peyote as part of a religious practice, you can't be, you, you should be punished for it. That was a shield all upon your religious, upon your religious beliefs. Somebody, the, the federal government couldn't infringe on that religious practice and that was gonna be protected. How they've now used it and how we're seeing courts use it is to infringe on somebody else's beliefs. It is okay for me not to sell you something, bouquets of flowers, a cake, because I don't believe in the validity of your marriage. I will not uh, provide, we will not allow adoption proceedings because we as the, <laughs> the nonprofit do not believe, do not recognize the sanctity of your marriage or your union. We are infringing, there, there's uh, multiple uh, examples of this from targeting of members of the Jewish faith, uh, other uh, religious minorities, uh, and housing and healthcare. Um, and the, the use of essentially religious freedom as a trump card, if you will, upon all other civil rights by saying, if my religion says I don't have to do this, then forcing me to do so is somehow an infringement on my religious beliefs. And therefore, I can't, you can't infringe upon me. And so therefore, you, you are the oppressor, not the victim. And the complete juxtaposition of, uh, of that relationship. And that's, I think something that we have to be extremely cognizant of and wary of, not just with Justice Barrett, but this has been this has been an emerging doctrine from from the conservative right, um, and will be going forward. We've obviously, as you know, got legislation um, to to try to rectify that, the Do No Harm Act, to recalibrate the role of religious freedom here, and to say, look, it is a bedrock fundamental value, but as a shield, right, and that. Our laws, our constitution are about balancing the individual rights and freedoms and the responsibilities of the nation and to try to recalibrate that. Um, but yeah, I've got grave concerns about what this could be uh, going forward and um, the work that we now have to do legislatively to, to make sure we strike that balance. 
Right. And, and as Kendall has suggested, it's this denial of someone else's humanity that it sort of um, rests upon, um, which just does not make sense. <laughs> it's un-American. Kendall, you had one more quick thought, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, just, just, one, just one quick thing. It's just sad that, that people, um, first of all, um, are sexualizing gender. Um, gender expression and sexual identity are two different things. I want to get that out there because um, the LGB community has a very different needs than the trans community. Um, but we get lumped in and, and that's all well and good to a certain extent. But, um, you know, for instance, people call me gay. Oh, you're gay. No, I'm not actually. I'm straight. I'm just transgender. So, you know, people like to conflate the two. And I, I don't know what that's all about. But I will say this. I don't know what we've come to. I don't know what, what we have come to as, as, as a people where we find that it's, it's okay for us to um, interfere with someone else's life. And I'm, what about, what about my panic? You know, we're talking about trans panic and gay panic. What about my panic? You know, we talk about religious expression. What about my sense of expression? I, I don't understand how someone can, and, and that's called subjugation when you do that. I'm being subjugated to um, your world, worldview about your beliefs. I have to kowtow to your beliefs. And that is totally unfair, totally, totally unfair. And also too, what it is, is this, um, it is a uh, anathema, it's anathema. So I really hope that um, people find it in their hearts just to be human beings and respect other human beings and allow other human beings to have autonomy over their own lives and not infringe upon it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and it is part of our conversation going forward. Um, I am getting the red light here. Um, so we're going to have to leave it for today. But I want to thank all of you so much for joining us here today and sharing your stories and your wisdom and your insights. You know, we're going to keep this fight going, redoubling our efforts because it's clear we can't take anything for granted. And we still have a lot of work to do. So thank you for being here, Congressman Kennedy. Uh, Kendall Stevens and Jennifer Pike Bailey. And thank you for our audience for participating and have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Everybody.